Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. My guest this week is Fisheries Management Section Leader, Scott Gangle. Today we're going to talk about the fall reproduction surveys. Uh, your fisheries crews are just finishing up. Scott, what are they? Well, fall reproduction surveys, you know, we, we spent a lot of time coming up with the name. They're done in the fall and they're used to gauge reproduction. The guys go out at the end of the summer, um, usually by the time the fish are big enough to catch in our gear and we'll set nets in, in a lot of our lakes around the state to determine how good natural reproduction was and how good our stocking success was. Okay, some of the methods you say you set nets, but obviously in the Missouri River system where there's a lot of current, you have to do things differently. What are the methods that you guys use for, for these fall reproduction surveys? Right, we use, a, we use a variety of methods. A lot of them are the same as what we would do in the summertime. We use gill nets and trap nets and electrofishing, but the difference in the fall is that they're geared towards just the small fish. So our gill nets have much smaller mesh, uh, half inch mesh is our standard, and then we have smaller trap nets with smaller mesh to catch fish so that they don't escape. And then uh, the electrofishing is done on the river because of the flowing water and the current. We usually um, use electrofishing both in the summertime for our standard adult and in the fall for our fall reproduction surveys on the river. Typically at night. Right. Electrofishing is done at night on most lakes and rivers around the state. What we're looking for is fish that are in the shallow water and, and, and by fish activity they tend to be shallower in, at night after the sun goes down. So that's been our standard and, and by doing it at night year after year we can compare from, from one year to the next. We don't have the staff to cover every single lake but you d we are just finishing up Lake Sakakawea at Devil's Lake. What are you finding there? Right, we have, out of our district offices, we have staff that, that cover the big reservoirs and, and lakes, what we call the big three. It's Lake Sakakawea, Lake Oahe, and Missouri River, and then Devil's Lake. Um, the guys are literally just finishing up this week, so I don't have the exact numbers, but the information that's been getting back to me is that we're seeing really good uh, numbers of, of walleye and sauger on Lake Sakakawea, so we think those, those two had a, had a pretty good year. Um, Devil's Lake is seeing pretty good numbers of walleye, but the Missouri River and Lake Oahe are still really low in terms of reproduction of anything. Um, the flood of 2011 really shaped and changed things out there. We've had some good walleye reproduction over the last few years, so it's actually a good thing that we didn't have a good year class again this year because we have a lot of small fish out there and, and we, you know, they're going to start competing with one another for, for limited forage, so it's nice to have some years. You don't expect a, a strong year class every year. You kind of have some years where you have these big boomer year classes and then you have some where uh, it's a little bit weaker. And that's not a bad thing. How about the forage on Lake uh, Oahe, Scott? Well, unfortunately, we, we haven't seen a lot of, of forage production either in recent years on Lake Oahe. And with all the mouths to feed out there, we're starting to see, you know, slow walleye growth rates. And, and I think anglers probably realize it too with the number of small fish that they're seeing. Those fish are a few years old now. Um, this year we did see some gizzard shad reproduction. The, the numbers aren't what they were back in, in like 2008, but we did see quite a few fish down around the state line and up, up to around Langlers, I think. Um, we, we did catch some gizzard shad all the way up to Bismarck. So there are fish in the system right now, so they did reproduce, but I don't think the numbers are there yet to provide a lot of forage. And if we can get a, a mild winter, they may survive and, and produce more and, and build upon what, what's there now. Sure. How about some of the district lakes? How, what are we finding there? You know, on a statewide basis, district lakes are always um, kind of the, the, the same. My, my answer is going to be the same. It's going to say there's some good ones and some bad ones. And, and the guys are finding that some lakes had really good numbers. Most of those are going to be stocked and not natural reproduction, but they're finding good stocking success in, in a few lakes and then somewhere it wasn't so good. And it's all dependent on, on the factors from lake to lake. Over the, over the course of the last summer, we had you know, droughts and wet, and, and it just depended on where you were in the state. There were some areas that were, that were pretty normal and some areas that were pretty dry. And, and we had some periods of warm weather and some periods of cool weather, and, and, and that can really affect our, our stocking success. Um, obviously, we, we manage roughly 450 lakes around the state. How many district lakes do they do they survey typically this in the fall? You know, we, we try to get to a lot of those lakes during the summer for our adult 
population surveys, but in the fall, it's a little bit more targeted, so we don't get to all of them. Probably about a third of them we'll get to. Um, what the guys are looking for is, is just trying to evaluate, like I said, stocking success and natural reproduction, but then also um, the success of a thi something like maybe a perch movement. If we uh, transported adult perch from one lake into a new lake, we want to see if they reproduced. Uh, we may be looking at forage abundance. Uh, a lot of our forage base on these smaller prairie lakes is fathead minnows. And since our gear is designed to catch small fish, we can also assess fathead minnow abundance in the fall. And that kind of gives us an idea of what forage is on, on some of our lakes too. Sure. Um, you yeah. answered this a little bit, but what, what is the data used for? Right. And so when we have that information, uh, whether it be stocking success, you know, let's say we have a pretty good year class coming up, that can help us determine how many fish we're going to stock next year. Uh, there's Stocking success doesn't necessarily guarantee that we're going to establish a good year class out there, but it's really important to at least have a lot of fingerling fish in, th in the lake. And if we see good survival into the fall, that's usually the first step. Now, they still have to make it through their first winter, and there's a lot of factors that can affect that. But, but hopefully, if we see a good year class in the fall, we'll see that year class survive to age one. And once they get to age one, that's what we call recruited. And that means that they're probably going to be in the adult population and start growing until they're catchable by anglers. So that tells us um, a little bit about, gives us some information on how well our stockings were and kind of what we need to stock next year. Uh, and, and that's where forage plays into it too. So we have these lakes where we have really abundant minnow populations. We may choose to, to stock walleye in some that we may not have stocked before. And that's really driven a lot of our new walleye introductions around the state is where we have these abundant fathead minnows. We're trying to take advantage of them and, and, and stock them fairly heavily with walleye. Right. So, so these fall reproduction surveys, they're very important as far as fisheries management. Yeah, they're one of the more important pieces of information that we collect. Summer has been very dry in a lot of locations around the state. How does that affect the water levels on some of these smaller district lakes? Yeah, depending on where you're at, we're seeing water levels that are a foot to two feet lower in some places, and, and even even lower than that in, in other places, like the far southeast has been really dry this summer. And and those water levels, you know, we've, we've been blessed with, with rising water the last five or six years, and, and ha to have a year where we're actually drying out a little bit is, is you know, probably going to affect things like um, perch reproduction. We're probably not going to see a lot of perch this year because they really thrive on that flooded vegetation. So when a lake is coming up and flooding vegetation, they do really well. When the lake is receding, they don't do as well. So we, we may not see very good perch reproduction. Um, and then just having less water in the lake might, might, we may start seeing some winter kills this winter. And that's something that we'll monitor as the winter goes on. Overall, in the big picture, Scott, how is the fish population? On a statewide basis, I think we're still sitting very good. Our, our big lakes, Devil's Lake has, has a pretty robust walleye population, and Sakakawi is, is very good right now. Uh, the district lakes, we still have over 400 district lakes, so we're still sitting good. They may have lost a little water this year, but in the grand scheme of things, I think that we're, we're, we're still riding with all of the fish, the adult fish, and whatever young fish that we have this year that has been building over the last five or six years. So I think we're sitting really well going into winter of this year. And we'll just see what Mother Nature gives us in terms of moisture for the coming year. A lot of good information. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. There are some seasons already open and some will open shortly. The sharp-tailed grouse and partridge seasons both opened on Saturday, September 9th. The early waterfall season for residents opens Saturday, September 23rd. And the regular waterfall season opens Saturday, September 30th along with the youth pheasant season. Pronghorn firearm season opens October 6th, and the regular pheasant season opens on Saturday, October 7th, and the deer gun season opens Friday, November 10th. For Scott Gangle and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us for this week's Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.